We're going to go right ahead and you'll know when a new episode's beginning because you will hear this noise. Uh. Not that noise. <laughs> well, you might. If you're ready. Shut your eyes, stop your ears, and sleep. Let the rumble of the engine and the sway of the road soothe you. Sleep, defenseless, vulnerable to the enemies who surround you. Sleep, oblivious to the simmering machinations of those who wish you harm. Sleep, and do not dream of the unstoppable disaster that surges to meet you at the unseen hour. Fragile creatures, beset by myriad dangers, we place our trust in the rule of law. We have faith that our society will hold at least some of that threat at bay, that we can let down our guard and put our well-being in the hands of something bigger. But the eye of law cannot be ever watchful, and in those blind spots between one place and another, every now and then a lapse occurs as it does aboard the ostentatiously opulent economy express off-peak overnight omnibus, Ooyoo, somewhere on its route from Evanhow to Karkos. Oh, I can't sleep anymore, Father. Look, the sun is starting to come up. Father? Father? What's happened? Oh, Flem, it's father. Look. Colonel Mops. Colonel? Wake up, sir. Sir. Oh, my God, he's dead. Oh, dear. Somebody died. I overheard you screaming hello. It's my poor master and employer, Colonel Mops. I've known him for years. He's never done anything like this. Look, Flem, there's blood. He's been struck on the head. Oh, it's all too horrid. A foul play! Foul play! Did someone say a foul play? I'll have you know that that's a legal term and should be used advisedly. Oh, and what are you, some kind of a lawyer? I am, yeah, 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 I am indeed, actually, yeah, yeah. And that kind is a copyright and intellectual property lawyer. Oh, I'll forward through this. I have some questions about parody in podcasts and what qualifies as... Bush, my, is this man dead? It's my father. He's been murdered. Excuse me, uh, would you mind keeping it down? I'm an old man and I'm trying to sleep. And I am a young theatrical ingenue and I am also trying to sleep. But look, something awful has happened. Yes, this poor man is, uh, is had his ticket stamped. I should hope that we've all had our tickets stamped when we boarded this bus. No, 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 he's, he's been put to sleep. Well, at least somebody is getting some rest. <laughs> No, no, he's come to a sticky end. I do not wish to know that. <laughs> but I, I think I have some, some wet wipes. No, here. no, no, he's, he's popped his clogs. I think that is perfectly acceptable on an overnight journey. <laughs> yeah, I do not understand why you are consistently selecting the most ambiguous of euphemisms. This man has been murdered. Yes, that's it. Someone's done him in. Oh, I see. My God, but that's Colonel Morris Mops. I know him. Me too. And so do I. Yeah, I think it's become apparent that we all know him. <laughs> and that the killer must still be aboard this bus. Yes, the killer must be one of us. Wait, there's one more passenger sitting there in the shadowy recesses at the back of the bus. <laughs> but all I see is an indistinct hairy mass. Wait, oh my, it's an enormous moustache. And behind it... That's right! It is I! The world's greatest detective! Rufus Strideforth! A detective, indeed. World's greatest detective! World's... Uh, yes, uh, Well, that should come in useful in clearing up this mess. Very convenient, indeed. Yes, very! For someone aboard this bus 
is a murderer. One of the eight of us. <laughs> but you are forgetting. If there are only eight of us, who is driving the bus? <laughs> Yeah, that's me, hello. I'm the bus driver. <laughs> Little bit behind there, in case you were wondering. Oh, so, so you, you can hear everything everything going on here? Then? Yep, I heard various thumps and bangs and other noises during the night, but uh, I've got to keep my eyes on the road, you know? You you do know there's, there's been a murder. You don't, you don't want to radio the police or anything? Like... <laughs> Well, I was thinking that since we have the world's greatest detective aboard, we could sort this whole thing out before this uh, National Express ostentatiously opulent Economy Express of Big Overnight Omnibus, we all, service, reaches its final destination at Kirkos, Devon Apple Street. Save everyone a bit of bother, right? <laughs> right, oh, uh, so I'll just solve the mystery then, since that seems to be the... the uh... Uh, I shall just, I shall just retrieve my detective things. Uh, magnifying glass, pipe, protractor, and so on. Uh, from this bag, where I have them neatly folded inside of this monologue. <laughs> <laughs> then we shall see. <laughs> have you ever gone to buy lunch in a sandwich shop to find someone restocking the shelves at exactly the wrong time? Their trolley right in the way. Did you get a little irritated? Bitch a little with your friend afterward. I have some information for you. That was done deliberately. Have you ever spotted someone flirting at the till with the person making the coffee? Deliberate. Has the person who was clearing up mistaken your full coffee for an empty one? Did you both laugh it off? Deliberate. All of these interactions, all of them, have been designed to create a memory of the shop. The people who work in the shop even have quotas to fill these little stories each week. Some of these interactions are tiny, such as must make the customer repeat each order thrice, or always forgets if the coffee is supposed to be decaf, or at a rate of one to three, put the meat sandwiches into the vegetarian section. <laughs> They have all been told how to behave. You all seem doubtful. Just another one of crazy Sarah's stories. But you haven't been there. I, I used to work in a sandwich shop, you see. Not a nice local deli, but one of those big franchises that you see everywhere. In every street, at every train station. You know the one I mean. So, most of the days in the train station, I serve the bitter coffees to the bitter customers. Sandwiches to the sandwich queue and sent the leftovers to the leftovers via charity. We all wore name badges at work. The true purpose of the name badge is to give the customer an idea of the character being played in the story. Every badge has a character and behaviours to go with it. These characters create little stories which you can relate to others subconsciously passing on the details about the shop itself. It's sort of unwitting word of mouth. Harmless enough, you might think, but one day they gave me a name badge that wasn't my name. <laughs> Melanie is not my name, I said. The rest of the team just stared at me. Melanie is your name, that, that is what your name badge says. Melanie is not my name, I repeated. Melanie obeys the code of conduct, the manager said, handing me my behavioural worksheet. I used to have a name badge with my name on it. Controversial, I know. In the story of the shop, my namesake was a temp, so I got to be cheery with the customers, ask anyone with obvious travel gear about their travels, I got to stare out of the window dreaming about my next adventure. Nothing too extreme. There was one week when I shadowed my colleagues. CJ, the robotic team leader. Caroline, her first language wasn't English. Penelope, the barista would rhyme and rap her way through coffee orders. Melanie, my new name badge they gave me was different. 
disturbingly different. New worksheets detailing our new interactions became in sealed envelopes each week. We had to read them in private. A new initiative, they said. Informed by customer feedback, but what feedback could justify the behaviour they wanted? Now, if a customer asked for a double shot, it was my job to draw a specific symbol on their cup instead of their name. I had to draw it in yellow marker instead of black. No idea why. A new coffee roast arrived in unmarked bags. If a customer asked for the new roast, it was made with beans that were foul and burnt. I started to be able to tell the customers who were about to ask for the new roast. They all seemed to have tiny mouths with thin lips stuck out in a pout that always made me think of moths proboscis. They all used what looked like antibac gel, but it was a sickly yellow. Somehow, they always managed to smear mayonnaise on their cheeks. I saw inside one of those coffee bags once. It wasn't coffee beans at all, but some kind of black syrup. It looked like Marmite or tar. The team leader saw me. That was my first warning. A new worksheet said I had to let one of the customers follow me home. Just at the corner of the street, they said. But what assurances did I have? They were already freaking me out with their sludge drinks and their fat smeared cheeks. I refused. They tried to get someone else to do it, but I closed ranks. No way. Our interactions became outlandish and vile. I watched colleagues lean over the counter to breathe as hot and loud as possible into a customer's face. Or refusing to change the obviously skipping music. It's not skipping, they said as the same off-key phrase played again and again for an hour. I questioned the team leader. They looked down at their tablet and swiped for something. I snatched a look. There were charts and analysis. There were thumbnails, videos. I raised a formal complaint. I was called for a disciplinary meeting. My behaviour had broken the code of conduct. They said, Our customers expect a certain experience. They said, we monitor and adjust the experience to produce the optimum outcome. Your behaviour on your way home is not appropriate for the brand. Incensed, I said that they couldn't dictate what we did outside the shop. They said that I was Melanie and that my behaviour reflected the brand no matter where I was. They said, Melanie follows the code of conduct. They said that Melanie was a big part of the storyline and had a great potential for advancement. I said that Melanie was not my name. They said, your name badge says Melanie. I took it off and I stormed out. I still sometimes see those customers in the street, gleaming fingers and smeared cheeks. Sometimes I, I think I see them outside my home. What are their experiments trying to accomplish? Am I still part of the storyline? How much of what happens in shops is a play? How far does their brand influence spread? Is this their attempt to control us all? Am I still part of the customer experience? Are you? Now, see here, we can't take the law into our own hands. We should wait for the police. <laughs> Spoken like a lawyer, Mr. Kent. Oh, that's right, he is a lawyer. A copyright lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> who is who is currently embroiled in litigation against Colonel Mops, a case which was not going well. Until the Colonel's sudden demise, that is. <gasps> that is a serious allegation. But I make no allegation. I merely present the fact. Why go any further? We have found our killer, surely. <laughs> if we had, it might save you some embarrassment. Miss Gabriella Yagchek. What? <laughs> Especially in the face of the upcoming merger between your business interests and that of the deceased. Curses. Uh, you are very well informed. Hey, anyone would think you had uh, Googled us. <laughs> oh, no, my, my research is a little more thorough than a, a cursory glance at the synopsis section of a Wikipedia article. 
<laughs> I, uh, I assure you of that. Uh, but, 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 but it proves nothing. I, I am no murderer. Maybe they're in it together. Oh, dear. Now they're all looking at me. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, hell, no, no, look, I, I didn't even know the man. No, perhaps not. But you did know his manservant, Flem Blue Point. <laughs> I never. I, I'm just an old lady. Are you? Or are you, in fact, Her Majesty Queen Sob of Asturitania, <gasps> travelling incognito in order to pursue the lowborn servant with whom you fell in love and free him from his indentured servitude? Oh, you're spot on. <laughs> we were going to run away together. But we haven't done a murder, I promise. It seems that everyone in is in cahoots on this bus. Yes, it does begin to look that way, doesn't it? Count Albert Grey! Uh, allow me to interrupt you there and volunteer the details of my connections with the deceased, potentially giving away more than is prudent. <laughs> I knew Morris from our time in the military. Uh, we have had a vendetta for years and fought several duels. I admit I hated the man. Um, but I would never resort to such dishonorable means to dispatch him. Mm, we, we shall see. Yeah. Now, there only remains the ingenue, who will now receive funding for her theatrical endeavors without interference. What? <laughs> I hadn't even thought about that. <laughs> and his daughter, who stands to receive a substantial inheritance. Well, I never. The very thought... Or would have done. What? Had the Colonel not signed a waiver that transfers his will over to the bus driver in the event of his death aboard a bus. <laughs> Hooray! <laughs> Which also gives the driver a pretty strong motive. Oh no! <laughs> So we're all suspects, and you haven't got any closer to solving the murder. No, no, to do that, we will need to inspect the body. But, Detective Strideforth, we've already seen that my father was killed by a blow to the head. That's right. He was clearly struck with a cudgel. Much like the one Flem is hiding up his sleeve! Oh, no! Oh, Ron, I admit it! I killed him! We had a disagreement, and in the heat of the moment, I'll give him a tap with Miss Shillelagh! No! Oh, but, my darling, you needn't lie for me. I wasn't. But I poisoned him with the tip of my umbrella. You can't have killed him. Well, now that you mention it, it was a very one-sided argument. <laughs> Well, there you are. It was me. Take me away, I confess, I suppose. Not quite! We must inspect the rest of this body. And to do that, we will need to extract the colonel from beneath our very own last chicken in the shop, acoustic bastard Andy Goddard. <laughs> Man, folks. Hello, uh, the name of my music act is The Bottom of the Barrel, uh, and that is what I am. <laughs> oh look, someone else doing the tech for me, this is so nice. <laughs> the oh, the tech. <laughs> this is the one job. Uh, so this song uh, is, is something I wrote a while ago, uh, part of a band. Uh, and there was a drummer, and it was on an electric guitar. So this will be an acoustic version. Uh, it is called... Uh, what? No just play. <laughs> well, this has gone on for ages now. I should probably just do the song. <laughs> down to the woods today you're in for a big surprise if you go down to the woods today you're gonna get eaten up right she's a man eater she's impartial too women and children and also you Mammoth colossus of hefty proportions Don't mean that she ain't into small portion Don't fuck with the bear 
she'll lead you a while Nature rails into the chlor and what is more I've never heard of a worse proposition than going camping in a bear's position. Oh, nature ran in tooth and claw. Oh, fuck the cuisine, she will eat you raw. Don't fuck with the bear, she'll eat you alive. Nature ran in tooth and claw, and what is more? To the woods. I would rather you did not go into the woods. Don't fuck with a bear. She'll eat you alive. Nature hands, tooth and claw, and what is more. Now, you see how this torso here has also been repeatedly stabbed? Well, that wasn't me. But who do we know who habitually carries a very, very large knife? Oh, no, no, that doesn't prove anything. Uh, anyone could have a knife concealed about their person. But probably not a gold-plated serrated ceremonial sword from Afghanistan that was clearly used on poor Colonel Mops here. Oh, all right, I did it. The little fool needed to be dealt with. I'd do it again. <laughs> Except that the stabbing isn't what killed him. You what? No. No, you may notice that the victim has also been strangled. I am beginning to see a pattern in your deduction, Stratford. Please keep your preemptions to yourself. These abrasions here are consistent with legal grade piano wire. Legal grade? Aha! The lawyer! Fine! It was me! But maybe he was probably already dead when I did it, maybe, hopefully. Exactly so! <laughs> you can plainly see he was drowned. <laughs> and if we inspect who amongst us has damp sleeves... All right, I did it! I did it for the money and because I didn't like him... But before that, he was cut in half! <laughs> Much in the style of a magical stage show. Well, it seems like a bad idea now, but it's all I could think of at the time. All right, you you seem to be saving me for last. So unless the driver's done something. Oh, I'll try giving his head a nudge. All right. Ah! Ah! <laughs> System of razor sharp wires. Was it me then? No, alas. Uh, you will notice that he has also been smeared with honey and devoured by insects. <laughs> I am the killer, although it does seem somewhat arbitrary. Oh, is it? No, sorry, you've lost me now. So, Count Greek, you think you've solved this mystery, do you? Well, I don't see any other. But would make you the greatest detective in the world. And I told you that I am the greatest detective in the world. Now, I couldn't let that conclusion stand, now could I? I don't see what relevance... What if I told you... <laughs> that this is not Colonel Mops at all, <laughs> but a very clever replica. Then he's not dead after all. Oh, certainly he's dead. I shot him myself before we even boarded the bus. Oh, come on. There's no way we could have figured that out. I know. Ha <laughs> ha. 
I was aware that each of you had a despicable plan and that I would soon be called upon for my expertise. I formulated a plan that would prevent any of you from solving the murder before time. The murderer is, in fact, the only person on this bus without a motive! Me! <laughs> well, uh, at least we're all off the hook. Not entirely. Y'all, you are all going to have to be arrested also for attempted murder and defiling a court. Blast! Oh no, I have so many regrets! <laughs> <laughs> And so, a bus full of criminals continues on its journey, and a man senselessly murdered is accorded some small measure of justice, however pitiful. And you too, dear listeners, must continue on your journeys, steering yourselves safely between the lines of the law, until the next unseen hour. We hope you were suitably cautioned against wrongdoing by The Unseen Hour, Episode 15, Murder on the National Express. <laughs> the Unseen Hour is recorded live on the first Wednesday of every month at the Rosemary Branch Theatre in London, thanks to unattended items. Join us next month to see The Unseen. This episode was performed legally by Bryce Stratford, Joey Timmons, and James Carney, and featured a monologue written by Peter Carrington and performed by Josephine Rattigan. The musical guest was Andy Goddard. Theme music by The Unrecorded. The Unseen Hour is written, produced, and created. I always read that wrong. <laughs> by James Carney. <laughs> and the podcast is produced mysteriously by Andy Goddard. Find The Unseen Hour in all the rest stops and service stations of the internet. If you would take a moment to rate and review us on iTunes, it would help us a great deal. We all look forward to seeing you here again at the Unseen Hour. <laughs>